this, I, I don't consider a philosopher, but a lot of people consider a philosopher, uh, and, and so on and so forth. It, this is another book about law, the, the arguing about law. And when we look at a text like arguing about law, Again, the Muslim contribution is from the medieval era. Since then, there is a list of names. None have anything to do with, so for instance, uh, people, something as, as critical as the concept of law. I mean, I mean if, let's say you are a specialist in Islamic law, how can you, write on Islamic law without first wrestling with the idea of law. I mean, the practice in Islamic studies is that you are, it's as if Islamic studies is, 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 is a ghetto of humanity. Uh, it, it says that you can write about Islamic law without ever reading a single book about law. You, you know, people wake up and they say, they decide, oh, I'm an expert in Islamic law. And everyone is willing to accept it. And they will get hired, they will, you know, they, they, they wake up and say, oh, well, you know, I'll open a few books on uh, Isla Islamic legal manuals. Uh, okay, and I'll offer a course on uh, Islamic law, what the heck. No, in other words, absence of standards. All these quote unquote specialists on Islamic law have no contribution to the idea of law, the universal human general notion of law. So what are the, the, the names in, in the field like this? I don't know how many of these will sound familiar to you, but uh, I can give you a sense of how important they are. Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, uh, extremely significant American jurist. Someone like Hart, the, fa the father of positivism, the, the positivist theory. Uh, Fuller, um, it, it belongs to the positivist school, with, with it's sort of called post-positivism, post positivism, a modification of Hart, but an extremely influential American theorist. Uh, Dworkin, another uh, influential American legal theorist. Joseph Ross, uh, one of the most uh, not American, but uh, one of the most influential theorists um, in the modern age. And Robert George, one of the most important Christian uh, natural law theorists. So his notion of law is saturated with Christian uh, uh, history, Christian uh, epistemology, Christian uh, understandings. Um, so is someone like Jeremy Waldron, um, uh, and, and so on and so on. Martin Luther King, you know, you've heard Martin Luther King, right? <laughs> um, John Finnis, very influential uh, natural law theorist, but also within the Christian tradition. Um, McCormick, um, very influential in, in, in the uh, positive law, uh, tradition, and so on and so on, and including Christian and Jewish theorists, on, they're not cited for a definition of Jewish law or a definition of Christian law. They're cited for a definition of law. Now, the, the question that I raise, and I want to, us to think about, and, uh, and if you're a Muslim intellectual, you must be concerned, you must ask, is it that you know, one possible narrative, one line of narrative is sort of the, the one adopted by uh, um, critical theory, uh, critical social theory, or um, uh, um, some alternate studies or many Marxist theorists that, well, the problem is is that the white man or the West 
excludes others. So the problem is, is that typical of uh, 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 um, uh, Western racism, typical of Western supremacy, the, the, those who are picked as relevant are those who fit within a certain cultural, uh, uh, um, if you will, um, uh, 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 nearly rituals of legitimation. Uh, you know, they, they come from the right school. They, they write in the right in the in the in the in the right type of language. Uh, they they phrase issues in a particular way. But another possibility is that the reason these two books have very few Muslim contributions is that since at, at least the 18th century, Muslims have contributed very little. In other words, that if I if I try to put a book together about arguing about the law, and I don't want, in other words, I want to engage humankind, right? I don't want to engage just Sharia experts. I can write a book arguing about Sharia, but my purpose, no, is to address the idea of the human being, humanness. So if I try to find Muslims who in, and this, this is going to be very important to, to at least, I mean, anyone, uh, when, when you, uh, you know that uh, I, am, I am a scholar whose cards are on the table. I mean, uh, as I said yesterday, I don't claim to, you know, to, to be some type of detached, objective, I, I don't like this, uh, uh, this game. Uh, uh, in, in, in that so from from my, my perspective in, in what what becomes very very important problematic that I, I would need to think about is although let's put it in a, in a, in a rhetorical question for me, Islam is it a regional is it a faith that claims universality or that claims uh, to be a within its own internal th uh, discourse? Does it claim to be a, a, to, to address humanity or does it claim to address a particular race or tribe or culture and so on? This is an elementary question, right? Well, it, it claims universality, right? The uh, no, Quran says, we have sent you a mercy upon Humankind. The Quran says, this is a mercy to all mankind. This is a message to all mankind. It, 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 it in fact uh, says that uh, all, all the prophets from Abraham to Muhammad, they, they were Muslim. They, 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 it, it, Islam is the essence of monotheism. So, but so if, if it would seem to follow, and in fact, as I hope to convince you uh, eventually, is that when people like Ghazali or even someone who's normally not thought of as a jurist or a jurist or, or, um, or uh, as a um, legal theorist, uh, someone like uh, Ibn Rushd, the famous Avros. Uh, you know, he, he's known as a philosopher, but in fact, he was a very influential uh, legal theorist. Jewish. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. He's a Jewish. yeah uh, and they, when when they spoke about when they addressed Sharia, they were not just talking about the phenomena of law for Muslims. They were like Joseph Ross, like Waldron, like McCormick. They were attempting to, to address the phenomena of law. Now, this will lead to some major misunderstandings among Orientalists about the universality of Islamic law. And, 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 and here's where legal expertise 
really does make a difference because the, the difference between theorizing about the law and defining the jurisdiction of law, that, that's a completely, like when, does, when, when do you actually implement certain rules as opposed to explain the phenomena of law itself, even normatively? But at what point, so I'm sorry, to, to go back to, to my initial question. So if I'm putting together a book about law, the second interpretation would say that it is not, the issue is not that, that there is a racial or either racially based or ethnically based or civilizationally based or uh, economically based uh, exclusion of the Muslim voice, but there is truly an absence of the Muslim voice because Muslims would, if, if I try to put together a book on law, I would not find many Muslims who talk about, who bother to think of Sharia in terms of law as a general category, to put it even more bluntly. How many specialists on Sharia do you think read legal theory in general? We know that Muhammad Abdu, for instance, uh, um, this is you know during this short-lived attempt at Renaissance, when he tried to rekindle the, the science of Kalam, he read philosophers, wide range, wide range of philosophers, and even debated uh, a French philosopher. Got his name in, in a, a well-known, well uh, incident. But it, when, when one of the things that really strikes you about the intellectuals of, uh, of, of Muslim civilization is their awareness of the relevance of the rest of the world. They're not just talking to Muslims. They're, they're talking to humanity. And so they, they're, you find it right there in their texts on jurisprudence, for instance. They are, at the same time that they are talking to Muslims, but they are also responding to Jewish theorists uh, to Christian theorists, to Greek theorists, to Persian theorists, uh, sometimes doing what lawyers often do, and that is uh, um, uh, plagiarizing. Uh, lawyers copy all the time from each other and you know, don't give credit for it. But the awareness of their uni the, the, the universality of the, or the, the universal implications of their discourse. Question though is, so what happened? Today, it is definitely in, in no Sharia school I am aware of, are you required to study discourses on law in general in order to be a specialist in law. If you want to be an engineer, you, you will have to study the science of engineering. If you want to be a computer scientist, you have to study the science. But in, in, if you go to uh, um, uh, uh, a, 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 if, if you want to study philosophy today, you're either categorized as an Islamic philosopher, and then you only read Muslim philosophers, or you are a secular philosopher, and then you read primarily Western philosophers, and discourse with Western philosophers, but you don't contribute anything original, so uh, you just rehash, uh, recycle what they say. So let, let me, let me um, pause here and, and, and try to repose the issue, because it's, all, it's, it's very important that we always know what issue we're talking about. It's very easy for me to, to confuse myself and, and get lost. Uh, which of the two paradigms explains something as simple as a phenomena of this book or this book or many other books. The absence of the Muslim voice. Or the absence of the Muslim contribution. 
Where should we look as intellectuals? I, I have to say I am kind of inclined a little bit to the subalterns that you mentioned at the beginning. Um, part, part of what I observe is maybe an illusion of secularism and a central idea that Western writers on law understand secularism and that's what they're putting forward in their context. And that someone from the Islamic world is automatically more kind of religiously informed. That's what I mean. I don't know in that particular text whether they're very open or clear about the Christian and Jewish sort of background of the thinkers. But that's my guess is that perhaps there is um, a slant towards the secular at the same time as, as the subalternists would say, a tendency in Western culture just to ignore. Uh, I would say it's a bit of those two elements coming together. Do you a fear that you, I, I think that Islamic law is is a is a is a very scary subject? Mm, I, absolutely, I, I, it's associated with you know uh, the war going on in Pakistan right now. There, there is a clear association for Western Islam. Is everything law. scary and 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 in fact, I mean the whole. Uh, one of the things that I confront quite often in, in being a professor of Islamic thought is whether it's law at all in any, mm -hmm. you know, the, you, you often deal with prejudices of what, if we, it's as if we talk about Islamic law, we're talking about a, a, a we are diagnosing an illness rather than <laughs> studying the subject. And, um, but, I, I mean, uh, I, I, I they're, 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 without doubt, I mean, even thinking of my own just experiences and the amount of discrimination and exclusion that I, in my own personal experience, have experienced as a specialist of Islamic law, to some extent, yes, I, I have to agree with you. That, I mean, it, it, for instance, um, when I do study, I, I do read quite a bit on uh, illegal philosophy in general, right? And then when I attempt to engage the mainstream, uh, let's say law professors in the Western world, from a theory, well, number one, because I, I am a specialist in Islamic law, there's an expectation that I should only say something about Islamic law, and that anything I, uh, and, you know, okay, thank you for your contribution, uh, uh, thank you for being sort of the, the, uh, okay. the token uh, Islamic voice now, uh, go away. Um, you know, recently uh, uh, Unger gave the Tanner lectures in Stanford, very, very famous lectures, and uh, and I was one of those invited to respond, and uh, they had someone from the Christian tradition responding, someone from the Jewish tradition, someone from the Buddhist tradition, and I noticed that, you know, I gave a very elaborate and, and engaged response, uh, but no one was paying attention simply because I am the Muslim voice. And all the, 95 percent of the discussion went uh, revolved around the Jewish response, the Christian response, the Buddhist response. So I, you know, and I also accept the, the fact that um, when you do try to engage a mainstream. Um, there is a if if your engagement is success is successful, you get an attitude often of this sort of suspicion as if you're trying to pull a fast one over over them. In other words, like Islamic law cannot be this sophisticated. You know, you, you, you're you're either making this up or this is just you. This is just a, a an idiosyncrasy of Khalid al you know, it, 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 it cannot be that this is, and, and I often, actually, I, I've been, this 
then said to my face, Owen Fizz from Yale Law School, you know, told me, uh, well, you know, if Islamic uh, legal theory was so sophisticated, uh, the way you say it, uh, then why are Muslims uh, so backwards? <laughs> well, he said it in my face. And, and in fact, they, they, they hired, they, 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 they initially wanted to hire Noah Feldman, uh, son of a rabbi, uh, a person who never studied Islamic law, has just uh, declared himself a specialist in Islamic law, you know, overnight. Uh, uh, because he it met his discourse met their stereotypes. It was very linear, very you know as he expected. He could explain the whole world by a narrative about Islamic law. Why is what's happening in Pakistan? Oh uh, well, you know I tell you it's because you know Muslims don't have a notion of appeal. There's no appellate courts. So, you know, their ideas of reality is this, their notions of space of this. Uh, the notion of time and space is lumped together in the sacred, and so they're incapable of, you know, and of course, yes, they, they listen and it's like, oh yes, that, that sounds, okay, thank you, you explained everything for us, now we can go and have dinner and, you know, and watch our shows and, and uh, you know, we've, now our, our world makes sense. But, on the other side, I, I try, I rack my brain to think of the, number one, the Muslim specialists in Sharia, I mean, I'll talk about uh, the fields that I'm most familiar with. Uh, Muslim specialists in ethics, theology, philosophy, or law who have engaged the universal international discourse and left, let's say, even left a sophisticated, complex tradition, even if, if, it, if it's a tradition that was ignored. But at least it was rich enough for me to be able to say, you know, this was so rich, the only explanation as to why it was ignored is racism. Because Substantively, it is spectacular. I can think of a few examples. I mean, I, I can think of uh, Abdul Rahman Badawi, for instance, in, in the field of Islamic in ethics. Uh, his, his vision of ethics, uh, he should be one of the, you know, when we, when we open books on ethics, uh, he should be one of the main philosophers of ethics. But, but how many examples like that can I think of? And, but this, uh, now again, uh, I, 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 as, uh, as a Muslim who remember the Quran imposes a, 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 a normative obligation, if you will, a moral obligation upon me to testify as to the truth. You know, say that you must uh, uh, testify to the truth even if it's against yourself, your parents, your tribe, and so on. So I, I must seek to witness, be a witness to, to, to the truth, wherever it is. I, and I've, it's, it's, it's attractive to blame racism or classism and just leave it at that, but I'm not satisfied that this is the, tr this is the full truth. Um, I don't know. Well, what do you think? If, if you question the first time about the, the contribution of Muslim in, in, in writing, but I, I thought I just I just I just want to try. About, I need also your your comment then, because mm -hmm. may, may, many people said that it is the responsibility of. Al Ghazali, for example, for his you know opinion to uh, not kind of against philosophy, then so that the creativity is gone then on 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 a Muslim in, in, in one side. I I don't really comment, but probably I also agree with that about the, the blaming the, that as, as Al Ghazali responsible for, for 
for the next future notion of Muslim contribution. The second is, it maybe it happens, I, I don't know, 18th century probably, about the, the Salafism notion uh, to return directly to the to the early tradition of the prophet. In some extent, it's also, and then cut all the tradition that happened after uh, the companions. I think that's also contribute to the to the lackness of the creativity of Muslim to engage to the older uh, knowledge than the Muslim knowledge. Because they always uh, uh, try to find a solution uh, on the Hadith and the Qur'an. In my opinion, it, it, it sort of become, yeah, lack of creativity. Well, I think this, let's, let's, let's um, this, this gets us into a little bit, uh, at me, it's a, it's a, I think we have some concrete. And who is this uh, marker thing that we had yesterday? Yes, the, the teacher. Who is this? <laughs> oh, was it Harris? Oh. Okay, we don't know. I think there's Chuck. There's Chuck. Yeah. Yeah. It's got me. We don't get up in there. Ah, okay. Or camera and so on. That's okay, yes. Okay, well, in, 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 one um, you know, a notion which is actually quite important is okay, the, the, the emergence. Ah. Oh, <laughs> we need to call someone. Okay, you know what? It's, it's okay. We, we, can, we don't have to use the board. It's just. It's, I think it's, it's also important. It's okay. <laughs> it looks like there's some kind of. But since since you, you can use chalk. Uh, if, you, if you want to. Yeah, that's, I mean, if you, uh, I don't know if you can see this. If you can ask, please go. Okay. Okay, the idea is the trajectory of the Salafi um, ideology. Uh, uh, and we, 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 we will need to unpack what is Salafi ideology. But Salafi ideology itself, the, the Salafi interpretation, taps into, into uh, another arguable historical event, and that is the Ghazali condemnation of philosophy. Now, okay, let's first talk about, focus about on Ghazali and, and what Ghazali does. Ghazali writes the, his famous book, The Incoherence of the Philosophers. Okay, now, I can, I can be fairly confident in saying that the vast majority of contemporary Muslims have not read the book. Mm -hmm. A lot of people talk about it, but actually reading it is something else really different, yeah. right? And th this is, this is uh, you know, we, we, we talk about cultural habits, and we have migrated from a, a, at least a civilization that produced, as we said yesterday, produced a great deal of texts. So many texts that it's, it's, it's truly mind-boggling just to try to keep track of all the Islamic texts, uh, or texts produced in Islamic civilization, to, to a very um, a sort of uh, text-allergic uh, cultures of of colonialism and post-colonialism, you know. So it's very. It's, but that we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, but okay, Ghazali writes this book, the incoherence of the philosophers. Ghazali writes also a self-narrative, a, a sort of a biography, where he says, you know, I used to be an academic. A I engaged in scholasticism, but I discovered that I was praying 
intellectual mind games and I lost my spiritual path. And then he closes with a famous text which champions mysticism. Uh, but 